And so we'd like to welcome all of you to worship this morning. And, um, you know, we're worshiping, and worship is worship, but here where we worship at Overbrook, our mission is to love God, love our neighbors, and love each other. Let us continue in worship with our prelude. Please join me in the call to worship. Who is wise and understanding among us? Those who seek wisdom and understanding each and every day. Those who delight in God and meditate on God's law. Come, learn more about the wisdom from above, a wisdom that yields a harvest of righteousness. O oh God, your wisdom is more precious than jewels. We draw near to you. Please join us for our hymn of praise, My Life is in You.
please join me in the prayer of confession. O oh God, we live our lives as best we can, dealing with difficult relationships and situations, putting failures and disappointments behind us, and moving into each new day with as much energy, goodwill, and optimism as we can muster. But we seldom seek your higher wisdom in our lives. We just move ahead on your, our own. Forgive us for not being rooted in your word. Fill us with your wisdom that we may live lives rooted in you and bear fruit to your glory. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Hear the good news of the gospel that in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the Our scripture reading for today comes from Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, young disciples. I have a bag here with some beautiful flowers in it. Can you see my beautiful flowers? Can you tell what kind of flowers they are? Roses, yes. Do they look fresh and lively? No. How would you describe them, maybe? Without having any life, yeah. They're kind of dried up, floppy looking. Why do you think they look like that? Just having a bad day? What do you notice about this part? Should, where do you think these came from? Yeah, roots. Like They came from a plant, a bush, a rose bush, and it was connected to that rose bush, and that rose bush was in the ground, and the rose bush had roots that went into the ground. And what do roots help give to the flowers and to the plants water exactly other things too but I think the main important thing is water and these roses have been cut away from the bush so they've been cut away from the roots and they're not getting any water and they're drying up and dying now the scripture passage for today says that people who meditate or Focus, read, learn God's word, or like a tree planted by a stream of water. 
So if we're planted, then we're going to have roots, right? And those roots are going to be giving us what we need to live as disciples of Jesus Christ. That means we're going to be getting God's word, which is going to tell us how to live and not only how to live, but how to thrive. Now, the beginning of the passage says, don't walk around with the wicked. Don't stand in the way of sinners. So just think like if if this roses were like you and me and we were hooked on to the rose bush where we were getting fed what we needed. So let's say these are us and we're coming to church. We're listening to sermons. We're going to Bible studies. We're studying God's word. We're having prayer time and devotional time. And so we're going to be thriving. But say some folks come along in the scripture, it says the wicked. But how about some people come along and say, hey, why don't you leave that rose bush and come along with us? We're going to go do some wicked stuff and it's going to be so fun. And you might say, yeah, but I don't think I'm supposed to do those things. They would say, That's just because people don't want you to have fun. Come on, go with me. But we're hooked to a rose bush, so it's going to be hard to go. So you kind of have to make a choice. Are you going to stay a part of that rose bush, a part of that church community where you're rooted into God's word, receiving what you need? Are you going to separate yourself from that? Cut yourself off from that source of life. And I just want to remind you that when we do that, we end up kind of like these roses. Our source of life is cut off. We begin to suffer and wither and dry up. I will tell you this, though. The good news is, it's not good news for the roses. I can't hook them back on the bush. I mean, I could. I could get some scotch tape and I could go out in the yard and I could tape them back to the bush, but they're not going to look any better than they do right now. In fact, it's just going to keep getting worse. But the good news is God loves us. And even when we make bad choices, even when we decide to cut ourselves off from his word and from his people and from his kingdom, we can always choose to come back, to be grafted back in as members of the body of Christ and to receive new life. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious Lord, thank you for just the amazing way that you love us. Lord, thank you that you loved us enough initially to give us your son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for our sins, that we might be like that tree planted by a stream of water, that we might thrive and flourish and bear fruit. Lord, thank you that your love even goes beyond that, Lord, that your love even extends and reaches to us, Father, when we turn away from you when we separate ourselves from you. Lord, thank you for welcoming welcoming us back home, for grafting us back into your body and giving us, Lord, not only what we need to survive, but enabling us to thrive through your word and through the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. And it is in the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Please join me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In today's scripture, the first verse of the first psalm in the book of Psalms starts off with instruction. But notice the whole first verse is about don'ts. Don't do this and don't do that. Don't walk in step with the wicked. Don't stand in the way that sinners take. Don't sit in the company of mockers. Now, that's helpful. That's very, very helpful. But I've always found in my life there's a limit to the usefulness when the instructions only tell you what not to do. I mean, have you ever um, gotten either a, a toy for your child that you had to assemble or maybe a bookcase or a desk that gets delivered to your house and you have to put it together? Imagine if the instructions only said, don't put part A with part B and don't put part C with part F. I mean, that would be a nightmare. I mean, it'd be somewhat helpful because you could be thinking, well, maybe these two go together and you'd look on the instruction and go, nope, that's not right. But then you'd just be left on your own to figure the rest out and that would be maddening. We as human beings, we learn so much by being told what we should do. In fact, if you grew up seeing your parents' marriage be a very bad, unhealthy marriage, and that's all you ever really saw, you had friends, but you never really hung around their parents, so you didn't get to see maybe an example of a healthy, happy marriage, then when you get married, it can be a real struggle because you may know in your mind and your heart, I don't want a marriage like I saw my parents have. But then you're kind of, you're like, okay, I know what I'm not supposed to do, but I don't know how to do it the right way. And so luckily in this psalm, the psalmist David doesn't just leave us in verse 1 with don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this. In fact, as soon as verse 2, he shifts into beginning to tell us what we should do. And so in verse 2, he says, Those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditate on his law day and night that person is like a tree planted by streams of water. So, okay, don't walk with, in step with the wicked. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't sit in the company of mockers. But instead, it says right there, we're to meditate, focus on God's word. Now, it's a short psalm. And when, you know, I was expecting like, verse 1 says the things we're not supposed to do, I would just think like it'd be a longest chapter in the Bible of all the things we are supposed to do. But instead of listing them out one by one, it just points to the whole body of God's Word. It just says God's Word is where these answers are. God's Word is how we're going to find our way forward. And it makes this analogy in verse 3. It says, if we do these things, then we'll be like a tree planted by a stream or streams of water. And you, they're like, why would that matter? Like, if I'm planting a tree in my yard, one, I don't think I've got any streams of water. And if I do, I've got to call a plumber because something's broken or leaking. And I'm just thinking, like, aesthetically, where would it look the best? But this is from a standpoint of what's good for this tree. What's going to make the tree healthy? What's going to make the tree thrive? Because 
If a tree is planted somewhere where its only source of water is rain, then as long as we're getting plenty of rain, that tree is going to be fine. But if we hit a dry spell, if we go into a period of drought, then that tree is going to start to suffer because its roots are shallow. They're near the surface. It's there to grab the water when it falls out of the sky. But when it's not falling out of the sky, that tree is suffering. But a tree is different if it's planted by a stream of water. Because it's an area where that water is concentrated. There's enough water that it's running and flowing. And so when it rains, that water's flowing. And when it's dry outside and not raining, that water's flowing. That tree has a constant source of life. Something else that it says is that it will thrive, it will bear fruit in season. But I kind of start to struggle a little bit because it's talking about a tree being planted and it's also talking about um, delighting in the law and meditating on the law. Like, how is a tree going to delight in something? Well, first of all, they did a study. I ran across a study that was done back in 2017 and it said roots of plants and roots of trees can Get this, I'm not making this up. You can look it up when you get home. They can hear water. That if you plant a tree and 10 yards to one side of the tree, there's water. And 10 feet to the other side of the tree, there's no water. The tree can hear the vibrations of the water moving in the soil and will grow towards the water. Now that's weird to me. I mean, amazing, God's creation. I mean, who would have thought? And you said, well, you said vibrations and you said they could hear. What is sound? Sound is vibration. Sound is wavelengths, which are various vibrations. So tree roots can hear they're hungry for water. They desire water. They seek out water. This has nothing to do with a sermon, but if you want to hear something really weird, <laughs> they figured out that they can record the sound of the water in the ground. And they can pump the recorded sound of water on one side of the tree and have the real sound of the water on the other side of the tree, and the tree can tell the difference and will go towards the real thing. The tree rejects the false message. The tree rejects the false sound and seeks out the truth and the reality. And it does so, and it finds that water and it thrives. So I think we can say that trees delight in water. They hunger for it. They thirst for it. They seek it out. They don't accept false substitutes. And when they find it, they thrive. Now, another thing it says here, which again, I kind of struggle with a little bit, that we need to meditate on God's word. And I don't really think of trees as meditating that often. Maybe you sit under a tree to meditate, but never really think about trees meditating. But really meditating means to sit with something over a period of time, to sit with it over a long enough period of time to have time to digest it. Now, I have with me a little vase of water and a plant in it. And um, can you see the base of the plant? What's it got a fair amount of there? Roots. Can you see the roots? Yep. 
Do you, does anybody know what kind of plant this is? What? Stacy, you're cheating. Of course you know what it is. She's been telling me for weeks to get it out of her kitchen, so she knows what it is. This is lemongrass. I love lemongrass and cooking. I like to snip the leaves and make lemongrass tea. And it's hard to find good quality lemongrass plants that really produce hardy lemongrass. So I go to an Asian market and buy some stalks of lemongrass and then set it in the water uh, in my wife's kitchen as long as I can get away with that until it starts to grow roots. But guess what? If I just bought the stalk of lemongrass and it didn't, and they don't have any roots when you buy them, and I took this little vase of water and I said, okay, lemongrass, drink up all you want. Okay, you're done. How many roots do you think I'm going to get? None. Because those, that plant needs time to meditate in that water. That plant needs time to digest that water. It's literally like three to four weeks before you even begin to see little bumpy parts on the base of the lemongrass to indicate that some roots are going to pop out. And now this is ready to plant after about six or so weeks. I can plant this now. Well, I think too often our relationship to God's word is a little bit like taking that vase of water and dipping something in it and pulling it back out. We hit a rough spot in our life, not having been meditating on God's word, not having been delighting in God's word. We're just going on about our business, doing our own thing. We hit a rough spot and then we grab a Bible and say, oh Lord, where I need some answers. Where's some answers, Lord? And then we feel like I, I, I thought the Bible had answers, but I, I don't, I'm not finding any answers. It's kind of like we're just dipping ourselves in at the last minute and expecting something magical to happen. It doesn't work that way. The people that I see facing really, really difficult struggles and challenges in their life, and I'll talk to them about it, and, and there's one person in particular in this church, and I'll talk to them about the, uh, you know, whatever struggle they're experiencing, and they'll say, oh, I'm just so thankful to the Lord that I'm taking part in such and such a Bible study right now because it is just really speaking to this challenge that I'm facing in my life. Or, yeah, I remember last year when I um, was reading this book of the Bible and studying this book of the Bible, and now looking back on it, that's really providing me the comfort and the understanding that I need right now. You see, they're not just having a little issue and then trying to flip through the concordance to say, because they're meditating, they're, they're digesting God's word. And because of that, their roots are growing deep. Because of that, when the struggles come along in their life, kind of like maybe a dry spell of rain, they don't wither up and get blown away by the wind because they've been meditating, they've been digesting God's word, and those roots are deep, and they stay deep, and they keep feeding them, even in those times of drought and suffering. Then the other thing that it says is that they will yield fruit in season and their leaves will not wither and what they do will prosper. For trees that bear fruits, did you know that if you have a drought during the fruit season for that tree, you would expect, okay, well, it's probably not going to have a really good year of fruit production this year because the tree has gone through this drought. And that's absolutely true for most every kind of fruit-bearing tree. But even if that drought ends and the end of the fruit season ends and then it gets regular water 
the whole rest of that season and leading into next fruit season, the drought from last year still has a negative impact on the fruit that it will bear in the following year. So you see, it's also telling us not only will being in God's word, delighting in God's word, meditating and digesting God's word prevent us from having that struggle here and now, it also prepares us and protects us as we head into the future. Now, I tried to play golf at one point in my life. Tried being the operative word. And I was so bad at it that I finally, before giving up, I finally decided that I would try to take some golf lessons. And so I, hired, I got some golf lessons from this pro at a golf course. And I would get out there on the driving range and swing, and he would say, you're bringing your club back too far. You're not following through enough. You're holding the club wrong. I was like, I knew I was bad before I came out here. You know, I didn't need to pay you to tell me I was bad. But that's all he seemed to do was just tell me I was bad. He wouldn't seem to tell me what to do right. And so I finally asked him, I was like, would you please just, I know I'm doing it wrong. Could you please tell me how to do it right? And his response was, well, you know, some people just weren't meant to play golf. <laughs> Got good news today. You may be at a point in your life and in your walk with Christ where you just feel like, I'm doing it wrong. And if you just read the first verse of this psalm, you may think, well, you know, some people just weren't meant to walk the Christian walk and to have a rich life of faith. But that's not the story of this psalm. That's not the story of the whole Bible. That's not the story of the gospel. The story of the gospel is that God sees what we're doing and is crazy head over heels in love with us. But he doesn't want us just to stay where we are. He wants us to thrive. He wants us to bear fruit. He wants us to be filled with delight. And he loves us enough to say the right way to do that, the thing to do, is to delight in, to meditate on, and to love my word. And if we do that, then we will bear fruit season after season. Amen. Please join us for our hymn of response, The One is Blessed.
as we acknowledge that we serve a loving, generous God, may we respond in faithfulness by bringing forth God's tithes and our offerings.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. How many of you grew up singing that hymn? Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Mm. Don't hear it enough anymore. And that was a just a moving, moving, powerful rendition of that. Thank you both for that. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. I see an arm or wrist in a cast, and you're here, so are things headed in the right direction? All right. Surgery's what day? Friday. Friday. All right. All right. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious, mighty, merciful Lord. First, Lord, we give you thanks for these tithes and offerings. Father, thank you for folks' faithfulness in coming forward and responding to your generosity and to your provision, Lord. It's that hymn, you can't outdo God's giving. Lord, you show us that day after day after day. Help us to be faithful stewards with what has been provided, that your word of truth would go into a world of confusing and false information, that your light of life and hope and resurrection would go into a world of darkness. And that those who have chosen to walk in the paths of the wicked to stand in the place with mockers, Lord, would either come for the first time or, Lord, return to you and to your word to not just some casual association with it, but to meditate on it, to delight in it, to be fed and nourished and established by it, Lord. Lord, we lift up all those who are suffering today, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, relationally, Lord. Lord, one need was lifted up today, and yet we know Each of us here today, Lord, has a need. And so, Father, we rejoice that you know those needs, Lord. You know what's on our heart even before the words are formed on our lips, Father. We rejoice in who you are, Father. We pray that as we acknowledge who you are, Lord, we also acknowledge that you call us to be your disciples, Lord, that Jesus told us, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And so, Lord, may we know that if we're being sent in the same way you were sent, it means ministry, it means service, it means sacrifice, it means living by putting others ahead of ourselves. It means doing and being willing to be uncomfortable and stepping beyond our zones of familiarity. Lord, may we be in those places where all we have to hang on to is you, Lord, and nothing else. Father, bless us. Continue to bless us. Lord, we would be bold to ask that our our blessings would just come and be overflowing, Lord. But not out of selfishness, but that we would be blessings to those whom you send into our lives and whom you send us into their lives. Lord, we pray that you would hear us now as we pray the prayer that Christ taught his disciples to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we leave this place, we leave this place as beloved children of the one true God, as those who are called to meditate and delight in his word. And as we do, we go from here, regardless of our circumstances, assured of the love of God the Father, Assured that our lives are filled with the grace and forgiveness and peace that is ours alone in Jesus Christ. And we go with the power and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen.